Thank you to Private Internet Access for sponsoring today's episode. PIA provides a secure, reliable VPN connection. Click the link in the description below to receive 82% off the first two years, plus four free months of free service. It's pretty fun to watch organisms eat in the microcosmos. There's a whole range of methods to enjoy. You've got single-celled organisms slowly absorbing prey into their bodies through phagocytosis, rotifers whirling the crown of cilia on their heads to get food into their mouths, and so many other techniques that shape the life and death of our invisible little friends. And at the core of this is a simple, universal need. Energy. Energy stored chemically as adenosine triphosphate, or ATP, that is made from the breakdown of sugars and fats. In bacteria, the production of ATP happens at the cell surface membrane, with protons and electrons traveling at the borders of the organism to drive the creation of this fuel. And the process is similar for eukaryotes, except unlike prokaryotes, eukaryotes have organelles, specialized bodies inside of them to carry out special chemical reactions. And there's even an organelle dedicated to making ATP. Perhaps you have heard about it. The mitochondrion, better known as the powerhouse of the cell. Yes, the powerhouse of the cell. The origins of that phrase actually come from a 1957 Scientific American article written by Philip Sikovitz that was titled Powerhouse of the Cell. It's gone on to become such a ubiquitous way to describe the organelle that it even has its own entry on knowyourmeme.com, which says, quote, the phrase is typically mocked as an example of impractical information taught in public schools. Now, obviously, we at Journey to the Microcosmos would never mock an organelle, especially one that is making it possible for us to do just about every single thing that we are doing at this moment. But we would like to take a moment to maybe lightly question some things. Because is the mitochondria always the powerhouses of the cell? No, not for all eukaryotes. And this matters because it shapes the way we understand the evolution of eukaryotes. There's a story about giant amoebas that we have shared before, but I want to talk about in more detail today, because when you're talking about exceptions and nuances to a commonly stated scientific fact, those details are fascinating. We also want to talk about it because we would like to talk about diplomonads and to share, again, one of our favorite historical observations of the microcosmos. In the 17th century, the original master of microscopes, Antony von Leeuwenhoek, woke up with some less than ideal bowel movements. But Leeuwenhoek knew a good opportunity when he saw one and he took his watery sample to the microscope. And he wrote, I have at times seen very prettily moving animalcules. Their bodies were somewhat longer than broad and their belly, which was flattened, provided with several feet with which they made such a movement through the clear medium and globules that we might fancy we saw a pissabed running up against a wall. Clifford Dobell, Leeuwenhoek's biographer, took this description and matched it to the medical knowledge available to him in the early 20th century to diagnose Leeuwenhoek with giardiasis, a disease born out of a parasitic diplomonad that colonizes the human intestine. Now, not all diplomonads are parasitic, but they are all just a little bit weird. For one, they have two nuclei. They also have eight flagella trailing behind and around them as they spin through the microcosmos. What makes diplomonads really weird, though, is that they do not have mitochondria. This puts diplomonads into a small and exclusive club with a handful of other eukaryotes. These organisms, which scientists grouped together into what they call the archozoa, are anaerobic, meaning they do not need oxygen and might even prefer to live away from it. And that would explain why they might not need mitochondria, which require oxygen to drive their reactions. But it does not explain how they got this way. 
So scientists worked with the information they had at the time to come up with an explanation, an explanation that would later be proven wrong. They reasoned that diplomonads and their fellow archozoans got that way because they just appeared a little too early. Mitochondria are thought to have been the result of an endosymbiotic event, where at one point in eukaryotic history, one cell engulfed a prokaryote. But instead of getting digested and consumed, this little prokaryote inside of another cell became useful in a different way. It became an organelle. And the diplomonads, scientists thought, just missed out on that big event. Except it turned out that the archozoa might have gotten in on the mitochondria party. They just also left it, losing their mitochondria to evolution's inventive ways. In the process, the archozoa were left with genetic mementos from their former organelle. One of the unique facets of mitochondria is that they have their own DNA, separate from the DNA of a cell's nucleus, but still able to instruct the production of proteins necessary to the mitochondria. But what became clear is that there wasn't nearly enough DNA to encode for all of those proteins. In fact, the mitochondria only produce a small fraction of the proteins they need, around 15% according to one estimate. The rest are encoded by DNA in the nucleus, transferred there at some point by the endosymbiotic prokaryote that would eventually become the mitochondria. This fact became important when scientists realized that some of these genes could be found in diplomonads and their fellow archozoa. Genes that encoded proteins, usually associated with the mitochondria, existed in organisms that were thought to have missed out on mitochondria entirely. Which meant that perhaps they had not missed out on mitochondria. Maybe they had had mitochondria and they simply traded them for a different way of life. Now, while there is always the possibility that these genes could have come from some other source, that alternative seemed increasingly unlikely as it became clear that archozoa have organelles similar to mitochondria, just rewired to suit the chemical needs of these anaerobic organisms. In the diplomonads, the organelle is called the mitosome. But curiously, despite the resemblance to mitochondria, the mitosome doesn't actually make ATP. It's mostly known to make clusters of iron and sulfur used in many other cellular functions, including metabolism. Instead, diplomonads make ATP in their cytosol, the soupy mix that surrounds the organelles. Other members of what was once called the archozoa have their own mitochondria-like organelles capable of making ATP, and the result has been a challenge to the story previously told about them, that these were early progenitors of eukaryotes, simpler than what would come after. If anything, it seems to be the opposite. These organisms very likely evolved with mitochondria like their fellow eukaryotes, but they also evolved out of them which means that there are so many other questions to explore. Questions about how organisms found their way and survived in anaerobic conditions, questions about how mitochondria have evolved, and questions about what the origins of eukaryotic life would have looked like. And as for the diplomonad, I suppose we should say that the cytosol is the powerhouse of the cell. And the point is not to poke holes in a popular biology aphorism taught to students. The mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell for many, many organisms, including you. But when it comes to evolution, the exceptions to the rules we think define us are the source of incredible futures written in mysterious and varied pasts. Thank you for coming on this journey with us as we explore the unseen world that surrounds us. And thanks again to Private Internet Access for sponsoring today's episode. PIA provides a secure, reliable VPN connection. Now you might be asking yourself, what's that? Well, a VPN is a virtual private network. It encrypts your internet data and hides your IP address, keeping your information secure and protected. But it also allows you to watch streaming content that may not be available in your area. So if you're wanting to watch a certain Seattle hockey team play their hockey games, but your sports streaming service won't let you because you're technically in the local viewing area, even though you live 500 miles away from Seattle, you can do that with PIA. 
Private internet access works with all major streaming services, so you have access to all your favorite content anywhere in the world. And PIA is available for all platforms, and one subscription protects up to 10 devices at the same time. And PIA has a next-gen server infrastructure covering over 83 countries and each and every U.S. state. You have a 30-day money-back guarantee if you don't like the product or if it doesn't meet your expectations. And right now, PIA VPN is offering Microcosmos viewers their best deal yet, an 82% discount and four free months when you sign up using the link PIA VPN slash Microcosmos. That link will be in the description. Thank you to all of the people who are on screen right now. They are our Patreon patrons and they allow us to uncover all of these very bizarre mysteries about life on this planet. There are certain folks who'd like to look a little deeper and like to see things a little stranger. And these are definitely some of those people. And if you're interested in supporting us so that we can make videos like this, the link is patreon.com slash journey to micro. If you want to see more from our Master of Microscopes, James Weiss, you can check out Jam and Germs on Instagram. And if you want to see more from us, there's always a subscribe button somewhere nearby. <laughs>